Okay. All right. Thank you uh, very much for coming to our 10th uh, and final uh, CHEPS uh, seminar of the semester. Um, I've given you actually a draft of the schedule for next semester's seminars. They will also be on Thursdays. The t there'll be a time change to accommodate uh, class schedules. It'll be between 2 and 3.15. So again, there'll be 10 speakers coming in beginning on uh, January 25th. Uh, again, largely in, in health economics, public economics, and uh, labor economics. So uh, thank you for helping make this the inaugural seminar series such a, such a success. And we're really excited to have uh, Hope Corman here today. Uh, Hope is a professor of economics at Ryder University, and she's also affiliated with the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, she's a leading scholar in the economics of crime and the economics of risky uh, health behaviors. And today is going to present some of her work from a larger grant proposal from NICHD on the effects of welfare reform on youth crime and substance use. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, it's, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So uh, first, I hope I'm standing in the right place. Right here. Don't move, don't move, right? OK. Uh, first, uh, let me just acknowledge my co-authors and see if I can make this happen. Uh, Nancy Reichman, who is at Rutgers in the University of Toronto. Deval, I never pronounce his name right. I call him Dave. He doesn't get offended, that's all. Uh, at Bentley and the NBER, and Ariel Khalil, who is at the University of Chicago. So um, we'll start with a visual. In August of 1996, um, some of you might recognize this man. Uh, Bill Clinton signed into law um, what was the PRORA Act, and uh, this it was the federal legislation to create what was welfare reform in the United States. And the purpose of this act was to end welfare as we knew it. Okay. So um, the PRORA stands for the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act. Um, which ended entitlement to cash assistance. And um, just to, even though this was passed in 1996, some states had implemented, just as many pieces of legislation, some states had implemented pieces or variations on this before the federal legislation. But the key features were time limits on receipt of welfare benefits. Generally, the time limits are five years. And work requirements as a condition of receiving benefits. The actual rollout started in 1992 with the first, this was through, um, what was the name of welfare, the welfare program before this legislation was called AFDC, or Aid to Dependents, Aid to Families with Dependent Children. And there were waiver programs starting in October 1992. And then the PRORA was implemented between 96 and 98, depending on when the states, each state had to submit their program to the federal government and get approved. And it took some states a little longer to do this than others. So it was a rollout. And the federal legislation granted a lot of discretion to the states. And if anybody is interested in how states vary in terms of their, how they implement this, um, the Urban Institute has an incredible database that you can go to to get the specifics of welfare in each state by each year. And um, it's, it's on so many different pieces that it's just very, very hard to consolidate it all into one. This state is strict, this state is lenient, this state is this, this state is this. In the past, we've looked at some education outcomes and to the extent to which education counts, doesn't count, how many hours. It gets so specific that when you want to look at welfare reform, it's, it's very multidimensional. And that's what I suggest you do is go to the 
Urban Institute uh, website. Okay. So, um, and there's, there was substantial variation in the timing of when fa welfare reform came in and on the generosity of the programs across the different states. So just to give you an idea of, you might not be able to read all of this, but this is just each of the states, some of them did and some of them did not implement a waiver program. For those that did implement a waiver program, we call that this is when they started their welfare reform. And for those uh, that did not, they started the welfare reform. So for example, Alabama never had a waiver program and it implemented its TANF, which new temporary assistance to needy families is the name of welfare, even though we don't have it anymore. Uh, is the name of the welfare program. I mean, we don't, we call it welfare. We, we still have this program. So just the highlighted ones, just to give you a sense, that Michigan and New Jersey were the first states to implement a significant welfare reform program in October of 1992. New York was the latest state to do it in November of, of 97. So if, if you think New Jersey and New York are similar to each other, well, they were pretty far apart in when they implemented welfare reform. California was one of the first to have a waiver program, but was the last to implement the actual federal program. So there's a lot of variation. If you look at the uh, paper, you can see this chart of when each state did it, and it's kind of hard to get a sense of, of, and I'll talk about how we deal with this, but why some states did it earlier rather than later, yeah? Were the progressive states, you know, self-parted states, perhaps among the first to, to experiment with it, and well, not didn't like what they had to do, and so they were the last? Um, I, I don't, oh, I see. So like, California's like California, California, no, I just think, I think it was a lot of administrative stuff. And given that they already had something, they had to figure out how to change what they had. And I think it was harder to change it to be consistent with the federal guidelines than it was to just create their own it was much easier. So I, I really think that's what happened. <coughs> But again, the Urban Institute, they're the experts on how this thing really rolled out. Okay, so the broad goal of welfare reform was to just get people to be self-sufficient and reduce dependence on, um, on public, being on the public dole. So the idea was that you had this marginalized underclass and you want to push them into the mainstream and Who's in the mainstream? People who are working and supporting themselves. I mean, I'm sure as a mom, <laughs> that's all I want for my kids are just to be self-supporting you know, as adults. So, um, so, and it was touted very much to give people this work ethic and, be, and have civic responsibility and just be much better people all together. That working is just, you know, this ethic that working is going to make you a better person. So the idea was that it would decrease socially undesirable behaviors and, um, and, it, and to transmit these mainstream values to the next generation. And it's very much in effect today, welfare reform, or this drop in reliance on public assistance 21 years later. So even though the legislation is old, the effect goes on every single day. So, um, so the question is, how has it worked? Well, and I'll show you in a minute, the caseloads have declined dramatically. So if the purpose of welfare reform was to get women off welfare, Great success, okay. And the employment rates of low-skilled mothers rose. Um, and the other pieces of welfare reform that were uh, explicit pieces of welfare reform, other than this amorphous be good citizens, 
uh, one had to do with marriage and one had to do with fertility. So the marriage was that they're, under the previous program, uh, families were, you had a, dis, had a very hard time getting on welfare if you were married. And under the new system, there, was, there wasn't the same marriage penalty. So the idea was that it would um, promote marriage. And um, also, under the new system, under the old system, if you had more children, you got more benefits. And under the new system was, if you had a child while you were on welfare, it, this did not increase your benefit level. So it was supposed to reduce fertility among welfare receiving women. And the evidence on here is not very strong that it had any effect on marriage or on fertility. Okay. Um, a third specific piece of welfare reform was that for a teenage girl under 18 who became pregnant in order to receive welfare benefits, she had to live with an adult, a family member or somebody else who's responsible for her stay in school. And the research has indicated that high school dropout uh, decreased through these minor mother uh, provisions of welfare reform. So on three pieces of the explicit pieces of the policy it was effective, on two pieces it wasn't. Okay. Just to give you a sense of welfare, ca yes? It's not time spent on the rules, right? Because um, the, the, the time limit provisions were designed to you know, not only reduce sort of total, total, total caseloads, right? right. But you know, even conditional on if you're on the, on the dole that you're on for shorter amounts of time. Like, to, to look at really the the rules, you're suggesting that that's going to happen. Well, we only could look at that, we, we didn't look at that in, in the average length of time, which is a tricky thing to measure. Um, so, I mean, we can get at it a little bit just looking at the overall level. So just to give you an idea, in the early 90s, the welfare caseload, so a case is a family, and FDHC was the original program, the name was changed to TANF. Over five million, Last year it was a little over one million. So talk about a dramatic change. Um, another thing is the recession in the early 90s, look at this huge increase in caseloads. The Great Recession, a little hill compared to a mountain. So even under the Great Recession, <clears throat> women didn't end up either on welfare the first time or back on welfare anywhere near they would than what the previous experiences have been. I think this is like, this is one of the most dramatic program changes um, that we've had. I, I just think this is incredible. One thing that is not being discussed right now in the news um, was that another piece of legislation that happened coinciding with this on purpose was the CHIP program, the Children's Health Insurance Program. And part of this was to divorce <laughs> children's um, ability to get uh, public health insurance from their mother's welfare receipt. It before the mother had to be on welfare for the child to get it. And, um, and after that, they're totally separate programs that, that if the mother, that if you're in a poor family, you would get, the child would get health insurance through the state's public health insurance. Now, just a little, if you, if you feel the same way I do, the Children's Health Insurance Program was up for renewal. Um, it expired September 30th of this year. Congress has been really, really, really busy, but they haven't gotten to this. So they have not renewed the CHIP program, and some states are starting to send letters to parents of children who get public health insurance saying, we don't have the money to cover your child next year. So if you think children should be getting public health insurance, right? I have, I have 
two senators and a congressional representative who are all Democrats where I live in New Jersey. So every time I write these things, it's like preaching to the choir. But for some of you, um, it's, it passed through the House, but the Senate's been too busy doing other things. So um, I think it's really important, and I think this is a crucial piece of this. OK, so has it worked? And, um, so looking at non-targeted behaviors, one of them has looked at the women's binge drinking um, and um, the, the research by uh, Kessner and uh, Teloff found that women's binge drinking decreased. Um, our research team has looked at drug use, binge drinking, property crime. They all decreased for the women. And we've also looked at women's, uh, looked at a positive behavior. We looked at women's voter registration and voting. And this was um, um, the, just, it, this was before the Obama election. So, um, and we found that voter registration and voting increased among women at risk for welfare reform. So this is our own work. And, um, However, some research uh, by Paxson and Walfoldel indicates that child maltreatment may have increased. So there's some studies find some things good, bad, different things, yeah? In terms of some of the substance use, what we, did, we were able to get at some of the mechanisms at work. Was it reduced income so they could spend it on this stuff? Was it more pro-social? We, we, we didn't, we weren't able to, in. That particular paper, we used, I think, five different data sets. Uh, but none of them really allowed us to look at individuals. They were all using um, more, um, another one of, I'll, I'll go to my, the, the best data set that we could have possibly used was the National Household Survey, the, I get it, National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Um, and for the past 10 years, they've been promising to make geocodes available, and they're still working on it. So that would be the <laughs> data set that we would use for that, and we couldn't do it. So we weren't able to do that, and we used every data set we could find. Um, and um, we might be able to do it with the NLS, why? Um, okay. So what about the next generation? What about the kids? who were children when welfare reform came into being and they were in, the, they were in childhood. So the idea was that this would foster uh, greater independence and abort this idea that you're going to be dependent your whole life. The mothers would mainstream good behavior by working, using less substances, voting, and all these good things. Um, changing their expectations of their future income stream. They're going to learn that you can't be on welfare your whole life because it's not going to be there for you. Um, requiring the pregnant teens to stay in school, which was a particular um, piece of welfare reform. And um, if the extent to which families experienced higher income, this might translate to better behavior. Um, However, the extent to which it might lower income might translate into worse behavior, more family stress, and less supervision of teens, either recalling your own teenage years or if you know any teenagers. Um, it does seem to be true that uh, teenagers behave worse when they're unsupervised. They get in trouble. Okay. Okay, so what do we know from the related literature? Um, we would think that um, we know that there's a strong welfare reform effect on maternal employment, so how would this affect kids? Well, um, through um, the employment of the mothers, although um, the effect of maternal employment on child behavior is varied across the board. There's not a particular 
Um, I'm sure, Shoshana, you're in, <laughs> um, aware of some of the literatures. Does mother's working affect child behavior? It's, it's a very mixed literature. Um, that it, um, that it, the supervision of teens, generally people find that teens who are left to their own devices are more likely to get in trouble. And income, generally, the literature indicates that the more income you have, the better your kids behave. And it could, there are a lot of mechanisms why that's true. So what we don't know. There's very little research on this topic in terms of the effect on the youth teens. So today, I'm going to be focusing on crime and substance use. Uh, the paper does have a few other outcomes, but they're very preliminary, and I hate to even highlight them at this point. Um, in future, we're going to be looking at delinquency, skipping schools, community engagement, school activity, school effort, and various health-promoting behaviors, eating healthy, sleep, and all good stuff. So um, in terms of parent modeling, the literature seems to indicate that uh, if your parents engage in criminal behavior, the kids are more likely to engage in criminal behavior. Um, and we definitely, our results indicate that mother's criminal activity and drug use decreased after welfare reform. Gender differences. OK, well, there's. There's different ways. First of all, literature, if you, for those of you who, some of you um, may look at crime and have studied crime, that, that from the very early ages, and I'll show you some statistics, um, males have very different crime patterns than females do. Um, and uh, studies have shown that factors that affect crime affect them differently for males and females. As far as specifically welfare reform, the conditions of the welfare reform we would expect to affect females more than males because there's a greater expectation of the females working after welfare reform than before, the big changes for them, and the female provisions that did provide for greater schooling for females. Isn't there, so, so I understand that second pathway, right? That some welfare reform was specifically targeted to, to yes. the kids in the victim community. Yes. So, so I get that. I mean, isn't there some evidence that, you know, it's a sort of story about, well, you know, thinking about younger boys being more sort of sensitive to... to Absolutely. Them. Absolutely. And that's, that's the, the, the factors that affect crime are different for boys and girls. And that's definitely true generally, that boys are more psychologically fragile than girls. So that is another argument for why there would be gender differences. OK, no, I, that's fine. That's why yeah. I know you were arguing that most of the stories go to why. No, it could very well be that the boys are more affected than the girls, because a lot of the literature seems to indicate the girls have more um, emotional resilience than boys do. Um, okay, so I, this is kind of a repeat of how this would work. If you have more uh, income, the kids might have greater access to employer-sponsored health insurance, and if there are mental health problems, better access to mental health care. Um, Brandy and I were just talking about how access to mental health care is not great on public insurance. Um, it's not always terrific on private insurance either. Um, the greater uh, supervised after school activities, parents can pay for activities for, they can go to art class, sports camp, all these things to keep the kids busy and uh, reduce household stress. Uh, pathways to increase crime is just decreased time of the mother, more stress, and less supervision. Okay. So there's a very limited literature looking at the effect of welfare reform on these substance use behaviors. Um, so there were some programs that looked, there were some studies that looked at these 
waiver programs and looked at specific programs. They were designed to assess specific programs. So some of these, even though the studies were good, they were based on a program that had 23 people, 15 people, 18 people. So it's very, and they were based on one study of one program that was implemented one way. So it's very hard to generalize from them, um, but they didn't get any effects on suspension or expulsion from school and the mixed behavior on school programs. There was a Canadian study. Um, they, they also had a small, Canada also went through a welfare reform program, but they had, um, they had low response rate. And then there have been a bunch of studies, at this three city studies on transitions on and off of welfare. But they just looked at women who were on welfare and then went off, or women who weren't, and it wasn't a very good experimental design. So our focus today is on, I know I'm going to make you head spin, hopefully, a little bit. Three papers, two of them are published and use the FBI data. And the third one is very preliminary and uses NLSY data, NLSY 79. So the first one is looking at uh, teen drug arrests. So did the welfare reform in the U.S. affect drug-related arrests of teens? So um, the, I think I was talking, was I talking to you guys about monitoring the future, right? So I'm talking about, that's if you want to get st just general statistics on teen drug use, monitoring the future is probably one of the best sources to use. And teens use a lot of drugs. Over a quarter of them in uh, 2016 had used drugs, illegal drugs, in 2016. All right, that, that includes marijuana, which is always illegal for minors, so it is illegal. Um, and drug use is associated with school problems, delinquency, physical and mental health problems. Um, we've all been reading about drug deaths being at a very at all time high. And, um, illegality can result in arrests and incarceration. So drug use is not always the best for, illegal drug use is not always the best for teens. So our main source of data are arrest files from the FBI from 1990 to 2005 by age category, reporting agency, reporting agency month, gender, and crime categories, the uh, raw data, and we aggregate to state, month, year, gender, age for drug-related crimes. We combine all crimes into one, all drug crimes into one category. And then we match this with the welfare implementation <coughs> dates that I showed you in that slide previously. Okay. So just to give you a sense of the arrest rates per uh, population, Blue is boys and red is girls. So as you can see, and this is by age, so this is 10 to 14, 15 to 17, 18 to 19, 20 to 24, 25 to 29. So uh, the drug arrest peak in the late teens, a little after what we're looking at, and they're very similar in this period between the 15 to 17 year olds and the 25 to 29 year olds. So teens are getting arrested at a significant rate for drug crimes. Now these are, this is aggregating all those years? Yes. And, and, and the reason we, this is the rate, annual rate. It's not the rate for the whole time period, it's the annual rate. But it's just to give you an idea of the age profile of these arrests. It's not anybody who's familiar with crime and drug data, uh, drug crime data, this is not, this is in keeping with what anybody else would, would find. And you see that the girls are operating at a much, uh, much lower level than the boys, although they're not declining at the same rate that the boys are. They're, they're not that dissimilar, they're pretty similar all the way to age 29, between age 18 and 29. So it's different patterns. So our empirical model is a DD framework. 
Um, it's our basic model. We're exploiting the timing of welfare reform across states over time. Um, if you read the actual paper, we both do we do it both ways of separating the waiver programs from TANF. Oh, I'm going to ju be just showing you the and any welfare reform. We weighted according to uh, the number of females in the state who are potential in the age grade group that's at highest risk for receiving welfare. Yeah. I'm just unclear to, to clarify about the waivers. So this can be a waiver from, from a state from the what was the federal welfare reform, uh, uh, was the federal welfare policy um, that could be a waiver for? No, it had to be, it had to have both aspects to it, work requirements and time limits. It had to be, it was characterized as being a significant waiver that had those two characteristics. So it wasn't just any welfare program. Okay. It was right. a significant. Right, because there were a lot of different waivers for a lot. There of were a lot of different waivers. These had, these had to be waivers with teeth. Okay, so just work, work requirements and time limits. Yes, okay. yes, and we're we're using somebody else's classification for this. Um, no, it had to have teeth because some of them didn't. Um, so uh, separate regressions for males and females. And uh, our preferred model adds state-specific arrests for males 25 to 29 as a comparison. And um, this was um, during the same time period as our as welfare reform in uh, the, from the 90s to 2000 was also a time of huge crime decreasing in the states. Just. Um, so here's our equation. So the argument is that males of that age are, are largely unaffected? Yes, the them. argument is that this would be the group that would be, A, still likely to be committing these crimes because the older you get, there's real drop off. The criminal career, this is a young man's uh, occupation, okay? and that these, they would be least likely to be affected by welfare because they're male, because we know the females were affected. They're not, and, and they're older. They weren't kids when it happened, and they're not recipients. And did you find that, by the way? Have you ever put sort of that on the left-hand side? Yes, 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 we do, yes. We do a falsification test, yes. I guess I'm trying to think of how this works as kind of a, I mean, I understand what you're trying to control for, you know, kind of changes at the state level, mm -hmm. you know, drug enforcement policy and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of other kind of crime rates. But I'm thinking that, because you have this window where it's, it's 1990 to 2005, mm -hmm. is that correct? Mm -hmm. So how do we think about this group you know, this, the 25 and 29 year olds are different in 2005 in terms of their potential exposure to changes in the welfare reform. If, if, you, if you're using this category yes. every year, yes. I, I, I can see the minute that the policy, you know, turns on and, and, and we start to see some kind of initial impacts, that this being a, a, you know, a nice group or a nice way to kind of control for that. By the time you get to the end of this sample, isn't some of the treatment in some sense blending into this group? Yes, and we uh, good good point. And we also we we definitely w did some falsifications where we cut short the treatment to like 2000. We cut it shorter to 2002 uh -huh. to see if that changed the results because that's exactly what you would expect. We want you're right. We want to keep this as clean as possible, and we don't want these adult males. To, be, to have been affected as teens, right? So we did do for a shorter time period, which is the best that we can do. And we also, in our other study, we looked at older cohorts also of men. You'll, you'll see to, to also do another way to try to get at this. But you're right, it's really hard to find a clean group here. Right. And we don't have a comparison group because we don't know anything about the people arrested other than their age and their gender. 
So we can't do like a DDD, which we do in the third model. So, um, so we, we can't do that either. So, but point taken. Okay, so uh, we have a bunch of basic covariates trying to get the state unemployment rate, per capita income. We, if anybody's interested in the nitty gritty of using this data to try to get a reasonable denominator, uh, <laughs> That's what all these different population things are there. We have criminal justice expenditures, a minimum wage. Uh, somebody's interested in that. Uh, poverty rate, uh, then we looked at the percent of the population covered by the FBI reports because it isn't for every um, reporting agency for every year. Um, we have a lot on the right-hand side. Okay, so in other models, we did the waivers and TANF separately. We extended our covariance for lag values of some of the economic variables. And we also had indicators for years pre-policy times the state indicator. So we've done this a lot of different ways. So anyway, here's our results. So um, without controlling for the male uh, drug arrests, we get, um, although not, we get a very large magnitude effect, about 10.6% increase in drug arrests um, for males 15 to 17. Once we control for the arrests by this alternative group, which may be a bit tainted by, by the treatment, um, this falls down to about Three, somewhere between three and four percent, and s some of these, um, you know, with different controls, these are very similar. They're not statistically significant. When we also, when we look at the the time that it seems to that the later the the effects are still there a few years afterwards. In fact, they might be stronger. The the um, this is just a coefficient on whether or not the state had a welfare reform policy in effect in a given year. And this is the percent effect on the crime rate, the arrest rate. Any questions on how to interpret this? Yeah? So what are the, the baseline arrest rates for these cohorts this time? Sorry. Um, so, um, so this was, the arrest rate was about 4,000 for the boys. Oh, this is, okay, I misread these the first time. Okay, so 10% so would be 400, the arrest rate. Okay. And then for the girls, it's about 500. And for the girls, we're getting, um, effect sizes, it depends on also uh, <clears throat> very imprecisely estimated or insignificant, depending on whether we want to look at the glasses half full or half empty. Um, inconclusive, but in this specification, it's about the same as what it was for the boys, about 3%, yeah? Um, and then, and then there's like a very kind of elite question, but how are we calculating the standard errors? Are, are you clustering them up the state? I'd have to go back to the paper, paper to remember how we how exactly we did the standard errors. Yeah? Is it um, concurrent effects of welfare reform on the welfare We lagged everything six months. Six months. Did you consider, I'm just wondering if maybe, um, you know, welfare reform that happens when you're a young child could actually have um, delayed effects. That's that's what we're looking at in the. Uh, that's what that's 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 where we're going with okay. this. Okay. That's where, we, but not in, not in this particular study. Okay. That's but that is absolutely where our study is going. Okay. Yes. Okay. I mean, we did do that to the extent that that we can look at how many years you've been this, exposed, right. and and we are. Um, you know, the effects are cer certainly seem to be taking some time, but, we're, but we want to get more into not just 
how long you've been exposed and how old you were when you were first exposed and all of those issues are things that we're working toward that, that I'll talk about and that's um, and our co-author, Ariel Khalil, is a developmental psychologist, and we're really hoping to get her um, adding to, to the economic t view of this. Has anybody specifically looked at the effect of, I know this is the form that you're looking at, the way you're looking at, but that is look at the effect of those school attendance requirements. I know they've looked at the uh, attendance requirement welfare waivers on school attendance of, of mm -hmm. teenagers and on fertility of teenagers. I yes. Think too. Has anybody looked at that specific waiver on crime? I'm just curious because it, because it is such a specific policy that crime. crime. Well, 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 we have, I mean, to do it separate from everything else, yeah, no. I don't know how you would do that. I'll tell you why. Because the waiver programs were not required to report to the federal government if they changed their program. So you don't know exactly what was in the waiver program so that you couldn't compare a state with and without before and after. And after TANF, all of the states had that. So, so I don't know how you would get at that. But we are, we are looking at crime. That's the next paper. Right, right, right. And then we compared it. <clears throat> we looked at those uh, states with strict work incentives versus weaker work incentives, where the work incentives are a carrot and a stick. The carrot is how much the, the income disregards or the earning disregards the more it, uh, earning disregards the mother has the more money she keeps from welfare so that would be and then the the stick would be um, if you're not working how soon you get kicked off welfare and, and what the actual sanctions are so uh, we are finding a negative effect on drug arrests for the women for the uh, girls with the strong work incentives compared to the weak work incentives, although the magnitude of that effect is really high. I think it's really, really high. Um, it's hard when you start splitting your sample like this. Um, and uh, we're looking at the welfare caseload decline. So, I mean, these results are generally a little, they're, they're not following the patterns we would necessarily think they would follow. Um, as far as the employment, this one is in that the effects are greater for states that had a greater increase in employment than the states that had a smaller increase in employment. So the summary of our results are welfare reform is weakly associated with higher levels of drug arrest, but it's very weak. Magnitudes were generally a little smaller for the females than the males, but again, with the standard errors, it's, it's hard to tell. Um, there's, possible, whoops, there's possibly some effects depending on the nature of the state. Um, and for females, it's just less consistent results with these heterogeneous effects. So it's a, it's a little dissatisfying, but we don't feel like we, we're talking about we don't have clear null results, but we don't have clear results. Where, yeah? Um, so prior to 96 and the state waivers, was there a lot of variation in eligibility for welfare across states? And would you be able to use that in some sort of like a case response in addition to the waiver? That's a good point, and I don't know the answer to that. So you're talking about free waivers? Yeah. Like if some states were more generous, then the implementation of a waiver maybe would have a larger effect. We did, I mean, we did look at the actual number of caseloads by state, and that would be a piece of it that could also be how poor the state is. Mm -hmm. So it could be that the poverty in the state is driving it, and it, we wouldn't be getting specifically the policies. That would be something really interesting to look at. Uh, so we did a sensitivity analysis. I didn't put in that we changed the length of our, of, we, we stopped at 2002. We did different functional form, non-log drug arrests. We, 
the, we included smaller agencies, and the other one we only included agencies with at least 50,000. I just didn't want to get too much in the weeds. Um, and aggregated to an annual level. So I'm going to go more quickly through the second study because the methodology is the same and the data is the same. And I want to get to the third study. So, um, so I mean, the interesting thing here is we're getting an opposite effect for the kids than we did for the mothers, if we have an effect at all. Okay, so the second paper is looking at youth crime. So, um, I just want to do, you all have access, I think, to the first paper, but that is go, that's coming out in um, Advances in Health Economics and Health Services Research. And this one is coming out in labor, labor, <laughs> Economics. Um, so this is looking at the non-drug arrests of teens, um, and we looked at this <clears throat> by age category, reporting agency, month, gender, crime category. Um, and we, we separated the crimes into two basic groups, and we get this from the way the FBI categorizes the crime. So there's serious crimes, and there's uh, minor offenses. So the serious, serious crimes, the, we're, we're not doing drugs because I've done drugs already. So, um, so here's the list of serious offenses and the ones that I've bolded are the ones that the kids are most likely to commit and be arrested for. So burglary, larceny, auto theft. So for those of you who aren't into the crime lingo, burglary is when you steal property through um, criminal trespass. You break and enter to steal property. Whereas larceny is stealing property without criminal trespass. So if you're shoplifting or po pocket picking, that's larceny. Okay, um, and we all know what auto theft is. Okay, so for minor crimes, there's liquor law violations, disorderly conduct, curfew, curfew and loitering, um, runaway and other. Now other was a huge category and they don't say what it is. And a lot of what's in this other category is kind of a black box that we can't open because every state has their own criminal laws and these could be laws, one state, the other could be fishing without a license, that could be a big deal, or hunting without a license, which could be a big deal in some states, and in other states, it's not an issue. So there's a lot of very specific things that vary from state to state that go into this other category. Um, a lot of this, this disorderly conduct and curfew and loitering are just kids getting in trouble hanging around on the street. And it, it could be police harassment, it could be kids being annoying, who knows. Okay. <laughs> you ever see kids <laughs> hanging around being annoying and, and people, some people call the police, right? They're not really doing anything or they could be drinking on the street or whatever. Okay, so again, here's this age, gender profile. This one, I'm just doing it for the pre-welfare uh, reform years. Uh, and um, for serious crime, interestingly enough, it's the teenagers who are most likely to be arrested for serious crimes. The younger, the 15 to 17 year old, and then it gradually starts to uh, taper off. Again, for the girls, it's a lot lower, and it doesn't taper off to the same extent for the girls as it does for the boys. For the minor crimes, we've got a little older on the minor crimes. Obviously, the, um, the adults aren't going to be arrested for runaway or curfew violations, so 
It's a little different. And then this is just over time. One of the things I wanted to just show was how much the blue one here is for our males and the, um, the black one is for males. This crime dropped during the 90s. And um, for minor crimes, there's a lot more jumping around. Um, but this is what it looks like over time for the minor crimes. Same, same methodology. Um, and here's our results. For the boys, we did it separately for the younger age groups. And the older age groups were not, even though they're, they're not even the same sign, depending on this. Um, the, we're getting a, it's really hard to do for the younger kids because their arrest rates are so low. For the older kids, um, we're not even getting the same sign. For serious crime for the boys, um, for the girls, um, not a lot going on. For the minor crimes, however, for especially for, these are for the boys, we're getting very large decreases in arrests and we're getting similar for the girls. Um, and again, this is heterogeneous effects. The summary of our results were no effect on, um, for serious crimes, there's suggestive effects for the younger kids for minor crimes. And here we are getting effect sizes that are a little higher for the girls than the boys, although not statistically significantly different from each other, the boys and the girls. Uh, so there were suggestive larger effects in states with strong work incentives with uh, greater decreases in uh, welfare caseloads. So this kind of followed what you would expect. Um, and the timing, there was a lag in the timing between when welfare reform happened and these effects and our falsification yay, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no effect on uh, males 25 to 29 or for uh, minor or serious crimes. So we did do that falsification in this study that... How do you find strong work incentives and stuff? That, we didn't do that. That was through, um, I think, an, an article by Blank and Schmidt where they looked at it and it was, again, going back to the earning disregards and the, the severity of the sanctions. It was a combination of those two things. We used somebody else's. Okay, so, um, so these are our results. So they provide some evidence of the mainstreaming effect of maternal employment on the next generation. Okay. So Again, just trying to sort of get at the mechanism, right? At work, is it is, is so? I mean, that implies that the story, right, is modeling sort of better yes. behavior, and so now you're not engaging in these minor sort of crimes anymore. Could though there still be some income-related channels? Absolutely, it could be income. And and wait till we get to the next study. We we haven't done any of this yet, so anybody. Anybody with, and we'll talk about, well, that's why I want to get to the end, with suggestions on some of these mechanisms or channels, that's where we need to do, you can't do it with the, the UCR data. So, um, so the, our, our new study is using the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, looking at uh, youth behaviors. And we're using the NLSY 79, with the child supplement and the young adult supplement. And it's, the supplements are bi biannual. And just to make life more interesting for us, uh, before 1994, they had one child uh, self-report um, supplement for all children. And in 1994, they split it for children younger than 14 and 14 and over. Um, asking somewhat different questions to make it fun to try to get a smooth. <laughs> they did it just to annoy me, I know. <laughs> I'm not paranoid. Um, and um, so we're looking specifically at smoking, drinking, and marijuana. We have a couple of others in the paper, although our measures are really 
even our measures were preliminary and I wouldn't put a lot of stock. We really need to do a better job defining those variables before I would put any stock in it. And we merged with the same welfare database. So just to give you a sense of um, with the NLSY data, um, we have means. So um, they're not the same time frame just to try to get the same variable across the two different surveys across time. So, um, so we're looking at things that aren't as severe probably as what we did with the UCR. We're looking at cigarette smoking uh, and alcohol consumption and marijuana use. What age groups are they? Okay, this is uh, 10 to 17. <coughs> Some of them are already married? No, 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 these are their mothers. The mother. This is, this is, so this is all of them. These are the kids with unmarried mothers oh. with a high school education or less. Sorry, I should have talked about what's at the top. Thank you. And these are for, so we have all in the sample what, what's going to be our target group, which is the unmarried mothers with less than or equal to a high school education, no more than that. And our comparison group is going to be the married mothers with the same level of education. So as we see, our target group has higher means for these things than the overall mean or for our comparison group. You don't know if the differences are significant? Right. And that's why we do our yes. So I'm, I'm cheating because I've seen it. Yes, seen yes. This before, right? so, but I'm still going to. Can you measure why whether or not it's actually, and I know it's endogenous to the, to literally endogenous to the policy, but whether they're actually, you know, the welfare receipt going on in that house. We know whether she's working. We know whether there's receipt. We know what her income is. We know what her work hours are. We know, we know, we, I mean, as much as you can rely on the self-reports in the NLSY, we can measure, we know how many kids there are in the household. We, I mean, we, the NLSY is, it's, it's, it's so rich that it's just hard to get around all of it. Yes, we can get it. This is our data set to get it at the mechanisms. But you only have 4,000 mothers who are unmarried, and then you have to look at all the states. Yes, and, that, and that's very and that's small cells in Idaho and this, these you know. these are mother years, so it's not even this many mothers. Ah. That's that. People face trade-offs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what we're really going to be able to do is a whole other story. Okay. So here's the means of these by gender and age, and thank goodness the, uh, the older kids are doing worse than the younger kids, otherwise we'd really be in trouble. Um, and um, in our target group, again, um, smoking, drinking, and marijuana use. Um, and then we have it um, for the two different groups. We have it males and females. And now we're in a situation, even though the girls aren't engaging in crime, they're definitely more likely to smoke than the boys, and pretty similar in terms of marijuana use and alcohol consumption. Okay, so we have a lot of variables. We have information on the, again, the, the issue is you want a parsimonious model to be able to not over identify at the same time that you want to have as many variables hold constant as many things as possible. So, um, oops, I keep doing this. So we have information about the moms, about the kids. We didn't do any of the endogenous variables yet on what the mother's doing. Um, and we have all kinds of information on the state. And so now we're doing a triple difference model where we're um, interacting w whether or not the state had enacted a welfare program with whether or not somebody's in this target group, meaning the kid has a mother 
who has less than or equal to high school education and is unmarried. And it can change in the sample over time for the same kid because the mother could get married, the mother could get unmarried. Um, there's some education going on as well, not a huge amount. I think there's more action in the marriage. Um, so this is our model. And we have a bunch of alternative specifications here. We have, uh, we did it again separately for AFDC waivers and TANF. We had no state variables, we added the state variables. And then we have state fixed effects with any welfare reform. This is what I'm calling our main model. We added lagged state level variables. We added a, uh, a pre-policy trend interacted with whether you're in the target group. Um, uh, a state linear trend and that's not all folks <sighs> we ran it with child fixed effects and with household fixed effects so here's our smoking results um, so just to give you this our main coefficients here are the interaction between the welfare reform and the target, the standard error, and the p-value. And then this is just the difference in the models. So for the first four, we're getting very, very similar results, adding more and more pieces to it, that our results are robust to controlling for a number of the things that we're controlling for. Um, Similar results, although not statistically significant, in the child fixed effects model, and somewhat different results, a little lower, in the household fixed effects model. So I, so I find this really surprising to me. I mean, I know that the significance is there, but the effect side is on par with everything you get when you have the child fixed effects model. Um, I think part of this is, is from the way that you're motivating it about this idea of breaking the cycle and that. It's something about, um, you know, like the kind of changing the household that the child might be growing up in. And the fact that it's, you see a child in, in, in one year and their, you know, mom isn't, you know, or is target, but it's before the reform. You see that same child in the next year where the mom is target and it's post reform. And that you're seeing this, this within child effect. Is that, is, is, am I interpreting that right? No. Within child effect is not significant, right? No. Yeah, but no, but it's close. It's close. No. It's, it, I would say the biggest difference is the household. If, if the sample is reasonably consistent over the years, the state, the ones with the state fixed effects should be, because this is just, this is just an average effect over all children in the state. Right, but, but I guess I'm struggling to understand the, I mean, I know it's not significant, I don't want to get bogged down, but the, I'm, the child, how do I interpret the child fixed effect, the, the, the model there? So you can turn out, right, you can, you, can turn, you can be affected by welfare reform then in one of two ways. It has to be the same child now entering the post, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the post welfare regime, or the mom, right, becoming unmarried? Well, we're, we're doing this. We're, well, well, we're doing this two ways, though, and and the, our next way is going to be holding constant the mother's characteristics in 1990, and then doing it forward to get to try to get the two possible things. So, for the most part, we're talking about kids, kids before and after welfare reform within a state, and this is for the specific child versus the average for right. children. So it's not, a, you wouldn't expect a huge difference in these two. And the fact that this is a little less precise kind of makes, huh? I think it's pretty, I mean, I'm sort of with Ryan if I'm interpreting his physical look right. That it, it's sort of surprised that it's as stable because that, that I mean, that would be picking, picking up anything sort of unobservable of the, of the of the of the of the of the, of the kid or that also right over the same kids. So I think it's yeah, I mean the, the fact that it's almost significant.
15, given you have a child, that yeah. you yeah. expect your standard errors to blow yeah. up, and the fact that you still almost have significance at the same point as yeah. yeah. No, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's very, it's very um, validating that, that, that this is so similar. This one is comparing siblings. But it's, so when I was thinking about this, yeah, I guess, I guess it is a little bit weird to think about the within child effect being almost twice the size and the magnitude of it. What I was thinking is when I look at, at, at the first four columns. But, but look at the, I mean, the thing is, and let's move on to the other outcomes right. too. Sure. Because this is just, I mean, this is just harder to do because there's fewer households, you know, just that have that that are affecting this because because some of the households don't have two children or two children in the right age group. Okay. Yeah. But what stage are you measuring whether the mother is married or unmarried? In this particular model, which again, this is a preliminary result, we're looking at it at each point in time. Our next one is going to be looking at it in 1990, and, and when we look at the two of them, we should get a different range. So we're not allowing the mother to change, we're looking at her initial characteristics. Okay, let me just, let me move on to the next one. Because in this one, this is on marijuana use, we're getting, again, positive somewhere between 1 and 2 percent, but not statistically significant, but all with, again, marijuana use was our smallest percent use. So we're, we, we still need variation on something that's kind of small. Um, and now we're getting a bigger child effect and a bigger household effect. So that's, that's, that's a little tougher to buy, right? Yes. Especially because it's intent to treat, right? Yes. It, yes. Yes. So it's it's again, we're, this is preliminary. We're still cleaning the data. We're still dealing with when do you measure the women's? We're dealing with all this. Yes. So. I mean, I can, t I can think of stories where this makes sense, right? So, and this goes back to, I think, what I'm struggling with in terms of interpreting results in your first four columns versus the child mix effects. But in your first four columns, I'm thinking about, okay, here's, you know, I think there's a family, you know, two kids in different states, but of the same families, right? And they're growing up in the same age cohort, but one of them, the welfare reform happened before they were born. Uh, so what we're really comparing is two kids in the same state. Okay, so okay, so one who has... Uh, one who's experienced welfare reform. Well, I mean, I, mean, I know. I look, right, uh, yes, okay. Effects, no, yeah. I, I mean, I, mean, I, I get that. Um, but so I'm thinking about different households fundamentally. But here with this, the child and the household fixed effects, I'm thinking about within child or within household changes. So suddenly last year, you know, it was right before the, the the reform happened. This year, the reform happened, and so like this, I guess maybe if the mom is working or I don't know, spending more time away from home, that that suddenly I now have more free time and can go smoke marijuana without my mom around. Whereas maybe something about having this benefit is the household composition changes in, in some kind of larger way, and is that what's and picked up in columns one through four. Like it's just a different environment in total. Like so the household composition? Household. Well, not composition in terms, sorry. That's a, I'm using that in very imprecisely, uh, given that I'm not a labor economist. Um, but I'm thinking just like, sort of like general household circumstances, right? We know that, uh, that I mean, uh, you're telling all these stories about. Kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. So it could be, it could be income. Right. It could be um, supervision. Mm -hmm. It could be family values. Right. It could be all of those things. And some of them could be making the kids more likely to smoke dope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and some of them could be making the kids less likely. So, let me. 
So do you find like there's any sort of like effect on the child, especially, you know, what, 15 legal age to work now? I'm not sure on child legal age. That, that, but, that's a great thing that we definitely are planning to look at is yeah. the child's the child's employment. And another thing that's part of this data set that we're, again, it's that the hard part is getting enough to do a statistical analysis given how we're trying to slice and dice it. So that's a big piece. The other is often the, and it tends to, believe it or not, there tends to be a gender difference here. If the mother is all of a sudden not working, it's the girl's older siblings who are asked to supervise the younger siblings, and they may or may not be compensated by the mother for babysitting. So that's another informal employment that, that the kids might be doing. It was. Um, in, in these child fixed effects regressions, um, you're not controlling for lacked economic welfare, welfare conditions. And do you have a time trend at all? Because well, we have, we have a the child, the child hope since, you know, the, whether they were born before or after the welfare. Well, we have the child's age. Right. And we know whether it's before or after. So we do know the cohort in that way. Plus, you'll see we do it separately by age as well. But the effect of welfare reform could just distinguish the fact that you would only be seeing that the welfare reform applies to the younger child and not to the, the older child. That would be the comparison. That's, that's, that, would, that might be. The household. The household fixed effects. I see. We have the siblings in the household fixed effects. So the same child. Okay. Yeah. So we have we just got about five minutes. Oh, okay. So let me let me move on. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. So here's our alcohol results, um, and um, I don't know. I think these are like our most stable results across different specifications. If you look at the standard errors, every you know you could. You could argue that they're not that different from each other. <clears throat> but what we do find, let me just kind of go on. Uh, we, we do get heterogeneous effects. Uh, we did it by gender. And um, the effects are larger for girls this time than for boys. And we're getting, not surprisingly, I didn't convert these into percents, but we're getting bigger effects for the older kids than the younger kids, because most of the younger kids aren't smoking, drinking, and using marijuana. Um, so um, it looks like, I mean, my takeaway from this is that welfare reform led to increases in youth substance use, larger for females than males, and suggested that there are these negative effects on the next generation. And these are kind of different than what we found with our UCR results. That's, yeah, so that's, that's my question. Have you come up with sort of a, uh, a story? We're, we're still working on it. We're still working on it. Um, but what is definitely, I mean, one story I think of is that in order to be arrested, you have to be kind of out there. So, so a lot of the arrests that we came up with and if you looked at those categories, our kids hanging around on the street. And now, if mom's not there, they get to do all that stuff at somebody's house where mom's not there. So they get to kind of idle it. They have more access to private places to smoke, drink, and use dope. So, uh, <laughs> so that's one possible explanation. Another is just a little more money, a little more in, but they're not hanging around on the street. And that our minor crimes were mostly hanging around on the street. Um, so we're definitely going to be looking at heterogeneous effects by mother's welfare history. We're looking at the ages of the other children, trying to get at that. Occupational skill level, the health, uh, the strength of these work instances, and the timing in terms of the child's age and the developmental stage. That's something we really, really, really want to look at that's part of our grant. And 
are the kids who were younger when this happened affected differently than the kids who are older when this happened. Um, look at maternal employment, income, supervision, household composition. I didn't put it in, but we definitely want to look at employment, and that is in this data set. Um, we're going to be looking at these other delinquency behaviors that are there, um, particularly there's um, they ask whether you've damaged school property, whether you've ever hurt somebody, and those were high. Having hurt somebody, boy, these kids are. Um, and we're gonna be looking at some favorable behaviors, school efforts, school community participation, healthy eating, sleep, all kinds of positive things the kids might be doing. And we're going to be using another data set, Monitoring the Future, which has much more detailed information on substance use for kids and some other variables as well. So um, I'm going to put down the employment. I don't, it's not on the slide. Uh, Hope, has welfare reform been reauthorized? Well, um, I don't know if it needs to be. That's a good question. This seems to be a first order sort of important question, right? About, about sort of next generation of- I know, I mean, we were really, really surprised that nobody's done this. And um, when we sent one of our papers to what I thought was a pretty high level journal we were desk rejected and told welfare reform is old news, nobody's interested in it. <laughs> and I'm like. But was this paper or the previous one? Previous, a, 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 a previous a, a old paper. None of these papers. None of these papers. And I thought, I mean, you saw that chart. I mean, it, to me, it's like so dramatic. And it was supposed to. I mean, if you go back to the news reports from the 90s, this was supposed to end dependence on public assistance for the future generation. But that was in 96. Nobody cares about this anymore. And I'm like, are you kidding me? But that's the bad news. The good news is NICHD thought it was an important topic. And we got a four-year grant to do this. So. <laughs> Part of sort of this broader movement toward kind of looking at these intergenerational yes. trends and longer term effects of policies you know, targeted at families. Yes, right. absolutely. I mean, I think that's something that's um, really in health generally. I mean, that's like that's where all the action is on these intergenerational effects now. So um, I, I, I'm just flabbergasted that somebody would make that comment that this old news, nobody's interested in this. It would be old news if it was a... Economists are not interested in What? <laughs> that, that was an economics journal. It was a journal of human resources. That's yeah, well, they are <laughs> that, that, so limited. I mean, and I just thought, um, you know, I understand if you don't like the paper, <laughs> but I, I get that, and, but I just, I, just think this topic is still very important, and um, okay. so. Thank you. No further. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let me get. Thank you all for coming. Get some food on your way out, and I will see you all on the 25th of January for our uh, opening seminar.